Ms. Madhavi Goradia Devan, I'd like to say a few words in introduction. She's a senior advocate and an additional solicitor general in the Supreme Court. And she is the youngest woman to have been appointed to this post. From commencing her career in the High Court of Bombay with a largely commercial law practice, very successful, to practicing in the Supreme Court on a range of subjects, including constitutional law, media law, and environmental law, she has an astute hold and understanding of the law from different perspectives. Over to you, Rhythm. Absolutely. And Arnav, like you said, uh, Madhvi Devan represented the government of India, various landmark cases. This includes, of course, the notable Triple Talaq case. Uh, it was the first time in independent India that we actually saw the government taking a stand that was drafted by her. She was entrusted with the task of framing the government of India's response to the petition in the Triple Talaq case. And in fact, uh, it was a path-breaking affidavit that had been drafted by her, where I remember the words were Mr. Jait Malani also. She said, secularism being a hallmark of Indian democracy, no part of its citizenry ought to be denied access to fundamental rights. Absolutely. But, you know, in that context, when you mentioned uh, what she had said in the, in the affidavit in the Triple Talaq case, you would also note that the Honorable Solicitor General beginning the conversation, kept harping on the point that the, the discussion on the Uniform Civil Code should not necessarily be linked to the ongoing discussion on Triple Talaq. He was putting this, this word of caution, and I'm sure at this very point of time, the government is firming up its views on the response in the Supreme Court yes. to, to, the, to the issue of clarity on the Uniform Civil Code, which, which she will be a part of as well. Well, that case culminated in the historic abolition of the practice and is often touted to be the gateway, as some say still, to bring in the Uniform Civil Code. And I'm sure today that Ms. Diwan will bring in personal insight from all the cases she has fought and legal scholarship to her lecture. I welcome Ms. Diwan to deliver her lecture right now. Over to you. Over to you, Ms. Diwan. Thank you very much. And thank you, first of all, for the privilege of, uh, of this invite on this very momentous subject of the Uniform Civil Code. And uh, I might add here, having looked at the very illustrious names on this panel, I'm, I'm privileged to be here also because without my presence, this might have ended up as a manner. So, um, well, I must also say that the views that I express today are not uh, official. They are my own views based on my understanding and experience um, as a lawyer. Uh, as a law writer, as a law officer in recent years, but most importantly, as a citizen of this very vibrant and diverse country. Um, the UCC, uh, the Uniform Civil Code, means a myriad different things to different people. And in fact, it evokes such strong reactions. Oftentimes, uh, it's, it's a red rag for some who believe that this is uh, simply a license to obliterate diversity uh, in India. Now, I think I'd like to uh, say, first of all, that I do not subscribe to those views at all. Uh, and it's important to, uh, at the very outset, uh, emphasize that there is a fundamental difference between uh, the erasure of diversity on the one hand and the erasure of disparity. What I think the UCC seeks to do is to erase disparity. Disparity in a manner which, which will be uh, um, uh, consistent with our constitutional commitments. And the erasure of that uh, disparity which it seeks to do would be uh, both inter-community and intra-community. So that is my understanding of what the Uniform Civil Code stands for uh, in a nutshell. Now, uh, we all know that the UCC appears in Article 44 of the Constitution, that is part of the Directive Principles of State Policy, um, and Part 4 is not enforceable in the manner that uh, fundamental rights are. We know this. However, when we, um, when we read uh, Article 44 alongside the freedom of religion, which is in part three and in particular Article 25. What becomes clear is that this is part of a very well thought out harmonious code which has been put into place by our constitution makers. And I see 
complete harmony, and I'll explain why, between the freedom of religion as uh, guaranteed, particularly under Article 25 and Article 44. Of course, Article 44 being part of, a, of, of the directive principles, it is not enforceable, it's only a constitutional aspiration. Uh, but nonetheless, there is a clear, uh, it can be beautifully tied up with the freedom of religion. Now, when we look at, the, uh, at, at Article 25, which is the freedom of religion, the right to profess, practice, propagate religion, it's important to note that there are some caveats, some qualifications to this right, which appear in Article 25 itself very loudly and clearly it has been put there by our constitution framers. And one of those caveats in particular is that the state shall not be prevented from making any law providing for social welfare and reform. So inbuilt in Article 25 itself is a recognition and acknowledgement by our constitution makers that religious practices may require reform, we may require social welfare measures. So that is an open acknowledgement right there at the very outset. Now, when this is inbuilt, this acknowledgement and this requirement of social reform is inbuilt into the, the words of Article 25 itself. It means this, that there is a commensurate obligation while we enjoy our freedom of religion and a commensurate obligation to embrace reform when it comes. There is absolutely no right to intransigence under our constitution. That is very loud and clear in Article 25 itself. There is nothing which is uh, set in stone, so to say. There is no right to resist reform that is clear from Article 25 itself. Now, therefore, it is not an unqualified right. Uh, so the question may be that, all right, there should be reform, but where does the UCC come into this? Now, when we do recognize that there is reform which is required, when that reform does come in, when you bring in something new, when the state is bringing in something new for the purposes of that reform, it is very important for the state and a secular state in particular to treat all its citizens and to treat all communities with an even hand. There can be no discrimination between communities. And therefore, when that reform is to be brought in, there has to be equality and even-handedness, no discrimination, which can only be achieved, essentially, through a uniform civil code. Now, um, so therefore, the idea of a uniform civil code then is to treat all communities on an even key. And as, as Mr. Arif Muhammad Khan said, as I heard him say, that the idea is to ensure equality of justice to all. Now, when we the people gave ourselves this constitution, what is it that we really sought to do? One of the uh, very celebrated scholars on the constitution of India, that is Granville Austin, he described the constitution as a social revolutionary statement. And it was nothing short of a revolution because the constitution was meant to be a charter for social disruption. Disruption in the sense that we were trying to break out of a long entrenched status quo where we had deep divisions in society on, on, on account of caste, the scourges of caste, of, of intercommunity violence and all of that. And also, of course, gender inequality, gross inequity towards women. So the idea was to shake ourselves out of that and to establish a modern democratic society which would be based on certain fundamental values. Now, what were those modern fundamental values? Those values were equality, of course. There would be uh, equal status for women in particular, gender justice, dignity for women in particular, and of course, everybody else. But these were the, the, the founding values and these were modern values that did not belong or were not taken from any particular community. So these were, in, in that sense, 
foundational values which we decided we as the people of india we decided to commit ourselves to this and when we decided to commit ourselves to these values it really meant that we we had to be ready to make some sacrifices every community across the board and mind you when when article 25 came about and the constitution was uh, uh, brought into force hindu society too was in dire need of reform so this was a pact between us that is we the people to commit ourselves to some reform in which we would have to give and take a little bit that is that is very uh, um, um, uh, that is ingrained in the constitution itself and another very important value which we also committed ourselves to and which is emblazoned in the preamble to the constitution is fraternity fraternity a, a value which is not spoken about enough but it is it is walking together in tandem as communities as different communities sub communities it's very very important to walk in tandem to fraternize and to ensure that nobody is left behind and social economic imbalance takes place between communities because we are not walking together and we are not perhaps embracing reform in a manner which gives justice to all members of the community now it is these values and i would describe i mean these are unifying values these modern values which i mentioned which did not come from any particular community these were the unifying values which form the core of the uniform civil code the idea of the uniform civil code so rather than just play on the word uniform i would look at look at it as a unifying civil code it is that common cord that common uh, sutra in a sense that binds us together as we the people who committed ourselves to this social revolution now coming back for a moment to uh, the freedom of religion under article 25 in particular i would say that uh, apart from the other qualifications which is that the freedom of religion was subject to the other provisions under part 3 that is other fundamental rights that apart it was also um uh, uh, qualified by another important caveat and that was that nothing shall prevent the state from making any law any law uh, which um uh, 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 in order to regulate or restrict practices which are political economic uh, or other secular practices which may be associated with religious practices now what are those secular practices these are marriage divorce adoption succession now um these are practices uh, which the supreme court these are matters which the supreme court has described as secular practices why secular because marriage divorce adoption inheritance are matters which confer on us as um as individuals as citizens they confer a certain status and an identity which endures beyond our interactions in our own community so it 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 goes on to our secular interactions as well and therefore these are treated a little differently now these are areas inheritance marriage divorce these are areas where women traditionally got a particularly raw deal and and that is what the uniform civil code would seek to redress um this is something where uh, and therefore i i would actually say that the uniform civil code has uh, a, a feminist agenda it it is it's primarily feminist because it, in 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 institutions in in matters of marriage divorce inheritance it is women who have really had an unfair deal now um just to give you a, a few examples when it comes to say divorce which was not uh um you know uh, there are certain communities uh, hindus uh, christians also uh marriage was regarded as a sacrament and therefore divorce was uh, uh, in a sense uh, uh, something which was came in later as a recognition of certain social realities now when say a hindu couple wants a divorce they go under their law um parsis interestingly um we are still um uh, covered by they are they're still covered by what is known as a parsi matrimonial uh, jurisdiction which requires a jury trial 
So members of that community have to sit in a jury to be able to decide the case and quite recently the Bombay High Court described this as a very you know a tedious and very time consuming uh, process which required some kind of streamlining. Now uh, um, um, you know oftentimes the process itself can be a punishment. Um, you know, even among Hindus, it's, it's not that easy. Uh, for Parsis, you know, there is this jury trial. Now, if you compare this, for example, to a Muslim divorce, if it is initiated by the man, then, uh, uh, of course, even though today instantaneous triple talaq has been outlawed, but nonetheless, uh, even the existing forms of talaq available to a man would take about three months. And they are essentially unilateral. Now, it's much smoother for a man. So, you know, he may say that, look, why would you want to put me through that process? I don't want to go through any law, pro uh, a long drawn process and, you know, uh, uh, present myself in court. So it's, it's a very swift uh, a process for him. However, that very process, the swiftness of that process, the unilateral aspect of that process may be a punishment for the woman. That process may be a punishment for her. So therefore, we have uh, uh, these, these disparities, perhaps, which need some kind of redress. Now, even when we talk of, say, bigamy or polygamy, and of course, I don't want to, uh, uh, I want to emphasize that, look, this is not confined to the Muslim community alone. It, it is it's much beyond that. We know that. But um, these are things which determine the status of a woman. So, for instance, it's all well to say that, look, how many cases uh, of, of bigamy or polygamy do you see in X community or Y community? They're not very much in number. But that's not the point. The point is that when that law applies to a particular community, it means that the woman is inherently unequal because she knows at the back of, the, of her mind the prospect of her being divorced very swiftly and unilaterally or the prospect of her, uh, her husband getting home another wife, it's a real prospect and therefore that determines her status, her conduct in her home, her aspirations outside the home and therefore that, that is really determinative of her social status. Now these are things which the Uniform Civil Code would try to redress because all women, no matter what community you belong to, are entitled to a full enjoyment of what the Constitution, a modern Constitution, offers to us. And therefore, there can be no disparity in your social, your basic human dignity, your basic social status. It is what we would call a certain grand norm of values, a certain baseline of values, a commitment that no matter what, no member of any community should be treated in a manner which goes below that baseline. So we the people of India committed ourselves to that grand norm of values, that lowest common denominator at the very least, if I may put it that way. Now, um, I, I'd say that, you know, We've postponed this much, much too long. This has been many years late, but it is still never too late. And all this whataboutery about other, uh, there's a lot of progress which has been made on other directive principles as well. It's not as if progress hasn't been made. But, and, and you know, there are other communities which require, all communities perhaps, including the Hindu community, requires reform perhaps in many areas. So therefore, that is not an answer. Uh, uh, and I would say that had we had a uniform civil code decades ago, perhaps a stitch in time would have saved nine. Because but for uh, 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 civ uh, uh, a uniform civil code, uh, if we had one, if we had one, perhaps uh, a Shahbano may never have needed to go to court. Shaira Bano in 2017 may not have needed to go to court at all. And we would not have perhaps had to flood the court with so many dozens and dozens of cases, which in many ways, it, because it deals with so many intricacies of personal law, it may be ill-equipped to handle. So therefore, there are cases, other cases, not just about marriage and divorce, but adoption, succession, all of that. Um, and therefore, I, I would say that we need a, a, a uniform civil code. 
Um, and, and what tends to happen is, uh, if we all treat, if all communities say our, our religion, our faith is a, is a way of life and uh, it requires no intrusion at all. Hindus may say it's a way of life, Muslims may say ours is a self-contained code, somebody else may say something else. But if we were to do that and, and, and resist this kind of reform or resist the, embrace, the embracing uh, a common ground norm of values, we would become nations within a nation which is a very dangerous thing. And I would say that unless we embrace that those unifying values, what tends to happen, and, and I think we have lost out in the last seven decades on that front, because this only tends to exacerbate the uh, 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 social imbalance in society, the, uh, the socio-economic progress of some communities tends to uh, uh, get left behind and that only creates more fissures and unrest in society. So I would say better late than never and with that of course I will acknowledge that this task, uh, the project of a uniform civil code requires a great deal of skill, it requires a great deal of sensitivity and undoubtedly but it is ne better late than never. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. I mean, that was absolutely remarkable, uh, Ms. Dewan, because you brought in a completely different dimension to the way in which we've been having this conversation so far. And, and what you've done, if I may, if, if I may just respond in, while in summary to some of your points, is that you have provided the sociological reasons uh, behind a very sharp legal argument. When you were speaking about the caveats to Article 25, and you said there was a, there's a possibility of reform, I would really think that it is the responsibility to reform. And you also spoke about the homogeneity and changes in society. As you know, as you know, Ms. Dewan, recently, and as Mahesh, we've all been observing, when the courts have been talking of the matter, they've been talking about the nature of Indian society itself. As a society, are we becoming more homogeneous or uh, more differentiated? And any society should really aim and towards as we become a superpower to be more homogeneous and and I think this is what the Delhi High Court said eh, when it said that in modern Indian society which has gradually become homogeneous the traditional barriers of religion community and caste are dissipating and if that is the vision which we have then the uniform civil code is is a step in that direction I I really appreciated what you said there about Parsi women and the recent uh, you know uh, observations of the Bombay High Court there and, and it fits in very well because it does not matter how many Muslim women would be worried about their husbands bringing in uh, uh, you know, a, an, another wife or how many cases of bigamy or polygamy do exist. The very fact that it exists, it, how many Parsi women would go through a cumbersome uh, a divorce is not the question about as important as uh, is the divorce procedure for Parsis exasperatingly cumbersome. And why should a Parsi woman who wants to have a fresh start in her life be denied what, what uh, uh, other women would, would access through their legal systems? So these are, these are you know, remarkable, Ms. Dewan, because these are very simple facts which you've said, but they are also the most piercing. And, and I think this has been a wonderful lecture from your part. We are all very grateful. We were all listening very keenly. I thank you very much. Anything you'd like to add, uh, Mr. Jetpalani? No, I, I, I think one end. statement of Madhvi's uh, stands out for me, and I, yes. you know, it resonates with me a lot, and it's what I said in my opening remarks, that, uh, you know, the Uniform Civil Code is really a question of gender justice. That's and Madhvi put it so well by saying UCC yep. is a feminist agenda. I, I couldn't agree more. Absolutely. It, it, and, uh, you know, we, we've seen this in cases like the Sabri Mala case, the petition were filed by w Muslim women uh, for, uh, for, for, for permitting Muslim women to enter mosques. So the society is changing. I think that's also a fundamental point. Well, you said this in a personal capacity. We look forward to what the government says in court. Thank you, Ms. Devan. Thank you very much.